One of the things that I really liked growing up were riddles. I always thought that it was so fun intellectually trying to figure out the meaning of certain statements. But then just very recently, I decided to look online to see what are the most difficult riddles in the world. And I found some pretty interesting ones. So here's one riddle. You measure my life in hours and I serve you by expiring. I'm quick when I'm thin and slow when I'm fat. The wind is my enemy. What am I? The answer is a candle. Okay, I'm gonna read it again. You, you measure my life in hours and I serve you by expiring. I'm quick when I'm thin and slow when I'm fat. The wind is my enemy. What am I? Makes sense, right? Okay, well, let's go through another riddle. See if you guys can guess this one. I have cities, but no houses. I have mountains, but no trees. I have water, but no fish. What am I? I am a map. Last but not least, what is seen in the middle of March and April, but can't be seen at the beginning or end of either month? Did you say R? He actually guessed it right. It is the letter R. I knew it. I knew it. He actually got it. All right. Do you guys want to play one more? Yes. Okay, one more. And this, this, this will pretty much illustrate the truth of what I'm saying. You see a boat filled with people. It has not sunk. But when you look again, you don't see a single person on the boat. Why? Here's the answer. All the people were married. I'm going to read it one more time. You see a boat filled with people. It has not sunk, but when you look again, you don't see a single person on the boat. What? Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, that's enough fun for today. <laughs> a single per oh my goodness. Oh. Okay, so isn't it interesting how when we hear these riddles, in the beginning, it's like such a big mystery to us, right? It's like, what on earth is the answer to this? But then after you learn the answer, you're like, wow, it totally makes sense. I get it. And you go back and read the statement again and you're like, yeah, absolutely. Now it makes complete sense. And you know, it's interesting that in the New Testament, Jesus often talked about these parables, which I wouldn't say is really like riddles. I mean, in some ways they are, but they're more like these long metaphors where if you present it to any typical person, they wouldn't really know what Jesus is talking about. But then if we find out the meaning of what those parables are, Jesus says it's not just for laughs or just to, you know, entertain us intellectually. He says parables actually have a great benefit to our spiritual health. And Jesus wants to tell us the answer, but the thing is we, want, we have to come and we have to seek for the answer so that we know exactly what it means so that we can benefit from it. So that is what Jesus is going to begin to talk about in this passage we're going to look at today in the parable of the sower, Luke chapter 8 verses 1 to 15. So these parables pretty much describe what Christianity looks like in the spiritual kingdom until the time that he returns at his second coming. So once again, we've been going through the Gospel of Luke, which talks about the biography of Jesus. You know, we saw how he grew up. We saw his three-year ministry up until the point where he is crucified on the cross and he resurrects, which is really what the Gospel message is all about, so that when we believe in him, we can be saved. So last week, we saw how Jesus was butting heads with the Pharisees because, you know, they were just talking smack about this this sinning woman who, who is wiping Jesus' feet, and Jesus is basically saying, this woman, she's got more faith than you do. Look at what she's doing, and you didn't do any of this for me. So it basically shows God is willing to reach any type of sinner, no matter how bad their background is, and we should be able to as well in evangelism. So this week, Jesus is going to jump into a new subject by talking about the beginning of these parables that speak about what the kingdom of God is going to be like throughout the entire church age up until the second coming of Jesus' return. So first, we're going to look at the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower, which speaks about how people will respond to the gospel when it's presented. 
So that's pretty much the main idea of today's lesson. So Jesus gives us these three key observations surrounding the parable of the sower that shows us the different ways that people will react to the gospel when it is presented to them. So let's look at point number one together. We get a deeper understanding of the gospel by first looking at the content of the parable. So first, Jesus is going to tell us the parable or the riddle itself without really telling us the meaning first. So we see that in verses 1 to 8. So if you have your Bibles, let's begin in chapter 8, verse 1, and see how Jesus begins this, this uh, lesson. Once again, Luke chapter 8, we're going to begin in verse 1, all the way to 8 for point number 1. So it says, soon afterwards, he, Jesus, began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. So Jesus was going around Galilee, preaching the gospel. So I want you guys to really understand what Jesus is doing, because a lot of churches get this confused and messed up. Jesus wasn't going around and teaching, you know, helping the poor, going around trying to reform the political system to get a better king in. You know, that's what we care about as people in society, but Jesus was trying to tackle a more important issue. He went around preaching the gospel. People are enslaved by sin. They have broken God's law, and as a result, when they die and stand before God, they are going to be judged for their sin, and they will be cast into the lake of fire forever. All of us could have ended up there, which is why Jesus needed to come so that he could live a perfect sinless life and die on the cross as a sacrifice, as a substitute to take all of our sins away. So yes, on that cross, it was a judgment tree, just like we sang earlier, because God's wrath came upon Jesus instead of upon us so that we can escape hell forever. So then when he rose again from the dead, it's basically his sign to us that those who believe in him will resurrect in the same manner. That is what Jesus went around preaching, and we should never forget that, guys. And it says that the 12 people, the 12 disciples, were following Jesus around because Jesus was trying to basically train them for ministry. They're going to be his missionaries. Look who was with this group, according to verse 2. It says there were also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who are contributing to their support out of their private means. Wow, you know, it's so interesting. We have women even following in the group as well. Now, this is worth noting because back then, women don't usually follow rabbis because that just wasn't a thing back then. They usually like to have men following them in their group. But the fact that Jesus invited women into the group shows how much he valued women, especially in a society that really degraded women. Jesus had a very high view of them. He included them in salvation and in the work of the Great Commission. That's so awesome. And these women, like I said, they were following Jesus around. And also those who were helping Jesus. Do you know how they were helping him? It says here that they were contributing to support his ministry. Obviously, because if Jesus goes around for three years, how on earth is he going to go around with his disciples doing all these things if nobody is supporting him? I mean, they got to work to make money, right? So obviously, somebody is supporting their ministry. So I hope that that gives you a good reason to support missionaries because they really need all the help that you can get. And thankfully, God provided for Jesus' group here. So in verse 4, this is where Jesus is now going to tell the parable. He says, when a large crowd was coming together and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. You see, we have so many people who are coming to Jesus. You know, a lot of them are superficial followers. They weren't really interested in, get, in repenting and getting saved by believing in Jesus. They just loved his miracles and you know, all this show that he was doing. So Jesus is about to now tell this parable. What is a parable? Do you guys remember I talked about this in Bible study? It's okay if you answer. You got it. Um, me? I, what is it? Like, I was taught before, if I remember correctly, it's like 
Uh, basically, like sort of like a very valuable lesson. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you're pretty much onto it. So a parable is basically a long metaphor or an illustration using everyday life from, is, from Jesus' time in order to illustrate a spiritual truth underneath it. That's what a parable is. So it's pretty much like a long metaphor with some sort of underlying spiritual truth. And oftentimes when Jesus told it, if you see the themes in all the parables, it talks about what salvation is. And it talks about, like, like I said before, true faith versus false faith. True converts versus false converts, which is actually a very serious issue. And we see it be introduced here in the parable of the sower. So in verse 5, before Jesus tells you the answer to this riddle, I'm just going to read it. The sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. And as he said these things, he would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's pretty self-explanatory, right? It says there was a farmer who went up and down the road. He was throwing some seeds and then some fell on really hard soil, you know, on the road where people traveled on and it didn't penetrate. And then a bird came from the air, ate the seed and, you know, took off. But then it says there were others that fell on rocky soil. So this soil was very shallow because the seed kind of went in and started to kind of sprout. But then underneath the soil was this really big layer of rock so that, the, so that the plant couldn't basically grow underneath. It didn't have enough root so that when the sunlight came, this whole thing just died. But then another fell on what looked like good soil, but then there were these weeds that were not detected. So when the plant was growing, Weeds were growing at the same time, and the weeds overtook the plant so that it couldn't get any sun, no moisture, and then that plant eventually died. But then there was another seed that fell upon soil that was like the perfect soil. There was no bedrock underneath, there was no weeds. I mean, it was just so good for the plant to take root. And then when it grew, some grew this much, some grew that much, and some grew, whoa, that much. So Jesus was saying, if you have ears, hear. So he's basically saying, if you can understand, understand it. Seek to understand it. So what Jesus is telling us in point number one is pretty simple. When Jesus lays out a spiritual truth, he wants us to learn what it means. Because it's going to greatly benefit us. Because if we ignore it, you know, like the gospel, it's going to only be to our eternal detriment. So he's telling us so many things in the New Testament to really help us to understand spiritual truths about the gospel. So are you seeking to understand it? So Jesus is telling us, what is the purpose of the parable? Why is he telling in parables? I mean, why couldn't he just tell the people in just everyday language? We see that in point number two. We get a deeper understanding of the gospel by next looking at the purpose of the parable. Verses 9 to 10. Why did Jesus t talk in parables in the New Testament? See, this is what the disciples asked him. In verse 9, it says, His disciples began questioning Jesus as to what this parable meant. So they were saying, what does this mean, Master? And Jesus said, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest... It is in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. So Jesus told them, the reason I speak to you in parables is so that you can understand what the gospel is in a very deep way. You can understand what true faith is so that you can get right with God. But then he's also saying, I tell in parables because I don't want the other people to know the truth. Maybe you're asking, why don't you want them to know the truth? I mean, isn't that the reason why you're preaching to all these people? You see, sometimes 
Have you ever heard that saying, don't cast your pearls before pigs or swine? So basically, sometimes when Jesus was preaching to the people, I can't say sometimes, it happened a lot actually, where he preached really good gospel truth to them, but then they made fun of Jesus, they were mocking him, they were saying he's a liar, he's crazy. So they basically rejected the gospel. They hardened their hearts just like Pharaoh. So the reason why sometimes Jesus would not continue to pursue it is so that he wouldn't increase their judgment on judgment day. Because God says that the more you know about the gospel and you end up rejecting it, then greater is going to be your punishment in hell on judgment day. So this in some ways is an act of mercy so that he wouldn't be increasing their judgment by giving them more knowledge. So that's why Isaiah chapter 6 verses 9 to 10, this is exactly what Jesus was quoting from. Remember, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Lesson behind point number two. If you, ha if you hear the gospel, you have an obligation to believe it. You know, there's a lot of people around the world who have never heard the gospel before. That's why we send missionaries to them so that they can hear and be saved. It's sad. They are going to be judged for their sins, just like everybody. But Jesus often said that the, those who have heard the gospel or who have read through the entire New Testament but ended up rejecting the truth will receive even greater judgment. So that is really the ultimate sin is rejecting God's mercy and love in the gospel. So that's what he's trying to tell us here. Okay, so now you're probably thinking, okay, then tell me, what is the meaning of the parable? I want to understand it. If you're asking that, great, because in the third and last point, he tells us, we get a deeper understanding of the gospel by lastly looking at the meaning of the parable, verses 11 to 15. So now he's going to tell us to the disciples, to Christians, those who can understand it, what is the meaning of at least this first parable? So in verse 11, now he tells us the answer to this little riddle. He says, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Okay, so based on this construction, we can safely say that the farmer is pretty much the evangelist. It doesn't have to be a pastor or missionary. It could be anybody. All of us are called the evangelist. So whenever we go around and we share the gospel, that's us throwing the seed. The seed is the word of God. So it doesn't matter if we're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody down the street or we're giving out a gospel tract to somebody. We're basically throwing out seeds. So that is what verse 11 is talking about. So in this passage, we're going to see how when the seed is thrown out, even though we want everybody to believe, sadly, it doesn't happen that way. So it shows us the different ways that people respond to the gospel and why they respond like that. So let's look at verse 12. It says, those beside the road, the seed, are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. So this is group number one. When the seed is thrown on the hard soil, you know, the soil where it's so hard that it just bounces right off it. These are talking about when the gospel goes to those who flat out reject the gospel. You know these people, right? They could be atheists, they could be agnostic. Believe it or not, they could even be religious people. People who claim to be Christian, they think that they're saved, but they're really not, and you're trying to tell them you're not saved, but then they try to get into a fight with you because they're so self-righteous. These are the people who have hardened themselves to the truth. That's why it's called the hard soil, because their hearts are so hard that the gospel just bounces right off it. But then it says, the, the bird, Satan, comes and just eats the word and goes away. Meaning that Satan doesn't want the gospel to linger in an unbeliever's head. He'll do whatever he can to get them to forget about it so that they won't even think about getting saved. Wow, how sad. But then we see another group in verse 13. It says, those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy and these have no firm root. 
They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. So the second audience are those whom, when the gospel goes to them in evangelism, they actually hear and they accept, at least superficially. So usually in the beginning, they're so happy saying, wow, look at what I've discovered. This is so cool. Jesus is going to help me change my life. Jesus is going to do this for me. You know, he's going to make me happy. But you know what the problem is? The, sh- the soil is very shallow. Remember, there's a big layer of rock underneath so that it blocks the plant from taking root. So basically, the second group has not repented of their sins. They believe the facts about the gospel, but they've never truly repented and turned and surrendered to Christ. Do we know, you know how you know? Because it says that when the sunlight came, which represents persecution, they just fall away. They leave the Christian faith. We've heard about people like this before, right? It happens especially, you know, in countries that are heavy, heavily persecution. That's how you know who true and false converts are because When persecution comes, they're going to be like, I didn't sign up for this. Adios. They just abandoned the true church. So their faith was very shallow and superficial. But then here is another group that's very interesting in verse 14. It says, the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard And as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. So let's look at the third group. So the third group also hear the gospel when it's preached to them. So they also accept it superficially. But you know the problem is in their hearts, even though it kind of the soil kind of looks good, there are thorns all around so that the weeds grow up and they eventually choke the plant. So Jesus is saying that those weeds represent all the distractions of life. So instead of persecution getting them away from Jesus, you know, like uh, the second group, it's pleasure. So the reason they leave the faith is they get so distracted with money, with fame, with jobs, with relationships, and eventually it's a slow death of their faith. Do you guys know people like this too? Mm -hmm, Because there's a lot of them even today. And Jesus is saying that these first three groups is the wrong response to the gospel, as in they're not going to make it to heaven. Now, let's look at the last one together. It says, But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. So the fourth audience is those who benefited. This is the only audience that's going to benefit from the gospel. It says that their soil was so good. There's no rock underneath. There's no thorns underneath. Do you know why? Because they have come to Jesus broken, repentant over their sins. So the Holy Spirit broke the rock that was underneath so that it was not hard, but that it was nice and soft. So that the word of God could come in and take root and do its work so that that person can be saved and transformed. And it says here that when that seed took root, you know what happened? It says fruit came out. 30, 60, 100. So what is he trying to tell us here? Well, Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, so then you will know them by their fruit. See, I can tell whether somebody's faith is real or not because when I look at them, I look for fruit. What is God doing in your life? Have you been changed by the gospel? Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Because this is saying that if you are truly the good soil in which the seed fell in, it should produce fruit. We should see some evidence of change by the Holy Spirit. And it's not going to be the same. It's not like saying, hey, you're, everybody's going to be exactly like the Apostle Paul or Peter. But there should be something, even if it's a 30-fold. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? There should be some evidence that you guys are saved. And also, that's telling us that those who have real faith, they're going to persevere. Meaning, when they say that they believe, they're going to believe until the day they die. There's no such thing as a Christian who says, I believed one day, but then last year I decided not to follow Jesus anymore. Like, I just kind of left the faith. 
Do you know who those people are? Those people who say, hey, I believed in Jesus, but I fell away from the faith. They're the soil in the second and third category. How else would they fall away from the faith? But Jesus says that the last category is where you need to be. Remember, good soil in which you have cleared your heart of all sin, come before God honestly with a good and humble heart, asking for mercy, asking for salvation, asking for Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, and God will do a miracle in you. Then you are saved. So in closing, Jesus gives us, I'm going to sum it up once again, the content of the parable, the purpose of the parable, and the meaning of the parable so that we can understand the gospel. And it's all to your benefit. So I want to challenge you guys with this. Do you have a right understanding of the gospel now that I've talked about this parable? Because the reason Jesus told us this parable is so that we can understand what we need to do to be saved. So that we can look at it and say, which category am I in? Because if you look at it and say, hey, I'm somewhere in the first three categories, do you know what that means? That means you need to get right with God today. But if you can safely say, I am in the fourth category, even though my life is not perfect, but I know I'm in the fourth category because I've seen God the Holy Spirit do his work in me, and I have true faith, and I will die for Jesus even if necessary, then let me tell you, your faith is indeed real. So I want all of us today, if possible, to make sure we are in the fourth category category, which is the only way to be saved. And I also want to throw out one more thing to you. If you know you're saved, then great, but don't let it end there. The reason Jesus tells us this parable is so that we understand how to do evangelism. Because when we go out, we, we have to understand why do people reject the gospel. And then when we see people who accept it, we have to understand, okay, then why is it that they're acting like this or acting like that because he told us the answer right here. So it's supposed to help us when we do evangelism so that we know exactly how to minister to different people. You know, and sometimes when we talk to them, even though it sounds really harsh, maybe there are times in which we need to say to them, hey, I don't know if you're really saved because I don't see fruit. See, we know that because we've read the parable, so we kind of understand what category they're in. That's why he tells us this. So this is all supposed to be to benefit you as a Christian. And Jesus says, this is the way it's going to be like all the way until the time Jesus comes back at his second coming. So he says throughout history, beginning 2,000 years ago, he says, this is the way people are going to respond to the gospel, these four categories until Jesus comes back. So let us make sure we are in, like I said, the fourth category, which is the good soil. Let's pray. Lord God, we truly understand what your word is trying to tell us. Let us come to you and let's know for a fact that we are right with you. Because you tell us that the only way into the kingdom is for the gospel, the seed, to take root in good soil so that it can do its work. So Lord, if there is thorns or if there is rock in our soil, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will break it up and clear it away so that the seed of the gospel can be planted deep in and that that seed can save us, save us from our sin and give us hope of eternal life. And Lord, we pray to ask for your forgiveness if at times, even though as Christians, we have acted like the people in the thorny or the shallow soil condition. Let us never go back to the way we used to be but to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, all to the glory of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.